Good morning. Thanks for joining us today. We have a presentation by Three Valley Copper. Um, some of you may not be familiar with the name. It used to be called SRHI Inc. They recently changed the name. I believe it was last week. Uh, so with me, I have Joe Phillips, COO, and Michael Starcinic, CEO. Hopefully I didn't butcher that too bad, Mike. Um, and before we get started, I will remind everyone that this presentation will contain forward-looking statements. If you'd like to uh, know more about those, you can find them on the company's disclosure on their website. Uh, and there will be a Q&A period at the end, so feel free to input your Q&A in the box at the bottom of your screen, or you can email them to me at debra.adcap.ca. And with that out of the way, I'd like to introduce um, Michael, who's going to introduce Three Valley Copper. Hi, Mike. <laughs> Good morning, Deborah, and thank you. Uh, and the name was just fine, so no, no worries, appreciated. And mm -hmm. again, thank you, uh, Deborah and Natalie Capital, for organizing this event, and to all of you uh, for joining us today. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Michael Starcinic, CEO of uh, Three Valley Copper, and I'm joined today by Joe Phillips, our COO. And over the next 20 minutes or so, we will take you through this unknown, underappreciated, and undervalued investment opportunity called Three Valley Copper. What I will do is uh, pull up the forward-looking statements, but I invite you to the website, kind of just like Deb had suggested, to really digest this. We will be using forward-looking statements in this presentation and uh, suggest you become familiar with the risks of such forward-looking statements. Um, so that gets through the, those formalities. We are a pure play copper company located in Chile and producing 99.999% copper cathodes coupled with an unexplored land package of 46,000 hectares in a very good neighborhood. A lot to digest in one sentence, but what we will hear today is a rare investment opportunity as we are, joint, we, as we are a junior mining company, 100% exposed to copper, that is a combination production and exploration story. What makes us most unique though, is that we are already set to participate in the coming copper super cycle. We do not have a 10 year wait period to get from prospecting to producing. Our infrastructure is fully built, no waiting for permits, no waiting for infrastructure financing, no waiting for environmental or other regulatory or political approvals, no waiting for 10 years between exploring, permitting, building, and then finally getting production going. We are ready today. We own 90% of the project with the ability to go to 100%. Operations are ongoing. We have two defined deposits. Don Gabriel is our operating open pit, and Papa Mono Massivo is our underground deposit that we are currently developing with construction expected to be complete, completed by the end of the year. Papamono is one of our two jewels and we will speak more to that shortly. And then there are seven satellite deposits identified that additional work has to be performed on. They previously formed part of a preliminary economic assessment we completed in December, 2018, that together with Don Gabriel and Papamono Massivo deposits provided an NPV of approximately US 425 million at $5 copper. Now at $4.50 copper, the Don Gabriel and Papamono deposits generate approximately 300 million of NPV at 8%, according to the sensitivity analysis derived in our technical report. We have strong partners in our senior debt lenders, Anglo-American and Chimera Capital. And additionally, we have an agreement with Anglo-American for 100% of the offtake. And our second jewel is our land package. We have no reason to look anywhere else. Acquisitions are no distraction to us as only a fraction of this land package has been explored. To put this in perspective, and Joe will further elaborate, our near-term exploration plans are looking at 1% of our land holdings. That's about five square kilometers of our 460 square kilometer land package. And this focus is on the land that lies between our two deposits of Don Gabriel and Papamono, which are only three kilometers apart. The board of directors are mining focused with complementing disciplines. Uh, to highlight a few, Terry, our chair, has sat on several mining company boards and currently is a director of Canaccord Genuity, Martin Ray International, and M Mineral Mountain Resources. Terry has a long, deep history in mining and also brings some unique perspective about copper from his directorship position with Martin Ray, one of the top auto parts producers in North America. In short, copper is critical to the future of the automotive industry. Simply put, the EV revolution is upon us and copper has a front seat to its success. Len is a retired partner of PwC where he led the firm's mining industry practice in British Columbia 
Len knows this industry and has current and has and currently sits on several mining company boards. David Smith, the CFO of Agnico Eagle, brings another level of expertise to this company. Not as he just a respected CFO in the mining sector, but his underground engineering background, coupled with deep IR experience, is a welcome skill set as we con as we construct our underground mine. Our management and technical team is equally impressive. Joining me is Ian McNeely, a weathered mining executive with an entrepreneurial spirit, serving as CFO, and Joe Phillips, our COO, has built, operated, commissioned, and constructed mining projects in 13 countries on five continents. He is perfect, perfect for this growing operation. We recently hired do, uh, Dr. John Mortimer to lead our exploration efforts. John is a seasoned, uh, is seasoned, spent a large portion of his career in Chile exploring for copper for BHP, and is credited with discovering Escondida North. John loves the potential of this land package, and we are very, very excited to have him leading this effort. Together with Joe, their combined experience in exploring, constructing, and operating is a key asset of this project. I also wish to highlight Jarek Jakobek and Luis Marino, arguably two of the top block caving mining experts in the world. The Papamono deposit is to be mined using the inclined block caving method, and we engage both Jarek and Luis early and often for the development. With their oversight putting guns, we are confident of its upcoming success. And overseeing the operations at site is Luis Vega, our site CEO, who has been with the asset for nearly a decade and brings deep history and continuity to the project. Today, our market cap is approximately Canadian 25 million as we are trading a little higher than what is shown on this slide. And after converting to USD and grossing up our ownership from 90% to reflect 100% of the project, our enterprise value is approximately US $90 million. This is a company with a high level of debt um, and our capital structure otherwise is quite tight. However, with approximately 56 million shares outstanding and on a fully diluted basis, we get to approximately 79 million shares. Our last reported cash position at March 31st was approximately US $5 million, but this was before our capital raise of approximately US $8 million in April 2021, just a couple months ago. On this next slide, uh, sorry about that, a little fast here. On this, on this next slide, I outline our debt structure of approximately $70 million across three tiers. This is the, at the project level, and this was used to calculate the 90 million EV of the company that I mentioned on the previous slide. Currently, only 50% of interest due on the senior secured tranche is being paid. In effective March 2022, both interest and principal payments will begin. Although expensive debt, we do have the ability to repay this in full at any time without penalty. So opportunities to refinance that, this debt are certainly possible. The next two tranches, both the unsecured term debt and the subordinated term debt, arose from the restructuring process that we took MTV, the asset through, during 2020. As part of the restructuring, the senior debt was extended a year and additional capital committed by the senior lenders. This additional $6 million is yet to be drawn. The restructuring was initiated primarily as a result of COVID in early 2020 and the quickly declining copper price at that time. As an offshoot of COVID, the Chilean government asked us to shut down the mine for a period of time while COVID was being contained yet maintain paying all employees we just did not have the financial means or flexibility to do this. And in February 2020, we began scaling back operations significantly and did not complete the restructuring process until the middle of November of last year. Shortly thereafter, we restarted the open pit mine operation at Don Gabriel and initiated the underground construction of Papamono Masivo. We are not a well-known story. As mentioned, this asset was restructured in 2020 and we only restarted the operation at the beginning of this year and began drawing attention to it earlier this year under the company name SRHI. A meaningless name, uh, arguably, that was updated at our AGM earlier this month and when shareholders approved the name change to Three Valley Copper. It was only last week, as, De as Deb mentioned earlier, that this name change became effective and the company rebranded. Located approximately three and a half hours north by car from Chile's capital of Santiago, our two deposits of Don Gabriel and Papa Mono Massivo are the foundation for the future of this company. We produce copper capitals, the quality of which is the highest in the market and accordingly demands the highest premium. Copper ranks third behind iron and aluminum amongst the world's most used industrial metals. Copper is used in pipes, 
wiring, batteries, transportation, and more. The red metal is without question a critical need for the global push for more sustainable, greener, and decarbonized future. The growing clean power and transportation sectors are expected to significantly increase copper demand. There is a 10 million ton shortfall projected in the market by the end of the decade if no new copper mines are built. Funding this gap is equivalent to building eight projects the size of the Escondida mine in Chile, the world's largest copper mine. President Biden's recently announced infrastructure plan calls for a 10-year extension of tax credits for clean energy generation and storage in a US $174 billion investment in the EV market alone, including building a national network of 500,000 EV charging, station, charging stations by 2030. Let that sink in. This is like increasing demand and struggling supply. The, the writing is on the wall. Copper is going up. We need new copper mines now, and they need to be huge. The current copper pipeline is the lowest it's been in a century. Copper prices will need to increase to encourage funding of this new supply. I have said this before, but cannot stress the importance of this. The process from discovery to metal is rife with pitfalls and obstacles from environmental legislation and community backlash to approval delays, funding concerns, and more. So when you find a copper project in a friendly mining jurisdiction with community support and fully permitted infrastructure, it deserves a closer look. This is Three Valley Copper. The project is fully permitted and has all the necessary infrastructure, a four-stage crushing facility, heap leach optimized for salt leaching, and a conventional SXEW plant with an annual capacity of 18,500 tons of cathode. No waiting for permits, no negotiating or waiting to get infrastructure built, no 10-year delay to production. A supportive community in a well-known pro-mining district we are ready now. We've been financed by Anglo, American and Kaimura Capital on the senior debt slide, and we have entered into an offtake agreement with Anglo for 100% of our production. This combination of fully built and brand used infrastructure matched by the expansive land package ripe for exploration are major differentiators when comparing us to other juniors. We have a rare setup here at Three Valley Copper, and as you will see, Valet was wise in its choice of property. But before I speak to Valet, on this slide is a snapshot of our technical report. Our technical report used a flat copper price of $2.75 a pound when it was released back in December of 2018. And the sensitivity analysis in the technical report does not provide for $4.50 copper, but it is easily derived from the available information. As a result, at $4.50 copper, our IRR on the project punches well above 1,000% IRR with an NPV of US $300 million. And this excludes our seven satellite deposits from our previously issued PEA. For details on that PEA, as I mentioned before, you'll need to go to CEDAR to see those results. I mentioned Valet a little bit earlier because this was initially their project. Both the deposits were found by them and defined in 2005, 2006, with another seven satellite deposits identified around Papamolo, Massivo, and Don Gabriel. By 2010, the infrastructure build was complete, and shortly thereafter, production began. But not for long, Valet invested approximately $250 million in building out the infrastructure that we then bought at about $0.20 cents on the dollar. Valet sold the project in 2013 because at that time, their incoming CEO changed the focus of the firm to be primarily on iron ore, and accordingly sold this fledgling copper project. Three Valley Copper performed some additional drillings in 2018 to support our technical report filed in the same year, but no further drilling on the property has ever taken place. In 2019-2020, we upgraded the infrastructure to handle the addition of salt that is applied to our sulfide ore. The importance of this is the effect that this corrosive slurry creates after mixing salt with sulfuric acid. It reduces acid consumption by up to 40% and accordingly reduces costs. It increases copper recoveries by up to 10% and reduces the leaching cycle by about 40%. Given our, 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 our ore is primarily sulfides, this is an important infrastructure upgrade that is now complete and operating at design parameters. We are in a very good neighborhood. On this slide, our property is outlined in blue. And as our geologists tell me, green is good and pink not so much unless you're in the business of producing gravel 
And as you can see, we are predominantly green and located in elephant country. For context, Antofagasta's Las Palombres mine, arguably one of the top 10 copper deposits in the world is our neighbor, approximately 50 kilometers to our east, and our land package is of similar size. Don Gabriel's our open pit and is currently in production. The proven improbable reserve summarized here uh, from our technical report can be accessed both on the website and on CEDAR. It is a mantle style deposit and the pit, as can be seen in this graphic, is a series of shelves cut out of the side of a small mountain. We operated about 3000 feet for full year access and comfortable working conditions throughout all seasons. Our plan with this deposit is to mine it until the second quarter of 2022, where we will pause and then restart it a couple of years later. During this intermission phase, it is Papamolo Massivo that will be the driver of our production. Don Gabriela Depth is also an exploration target that Joe will highlight in a few more slides. The Papamolo Massivo deposit is one of our two jewels and our primary focus for 2021 and into 2022. It is currently under construction with the goal of it being completed by the end of this year on time and within budget. And with an average grade of one and a half percent, this deposit is expected to deliver 102 million pounds of, cut of contained copper while driving down costs between $1.60 and $1.80 per pound, less than half the cost of other available mining methods. The method chosen to mine this deposit is the incline block caving method, an, up an upfront capital intensive project, but thereafter a very efficient and low cost method of mining ore. The deposit is well defined, and well understood. We were fortunate to inherit some of Valley's previous tunneling into this deposit, allowing for excellent follow-on work to support the conclusion stated in the technical report. This is the catalyst for Three Valley Copper's success, and this is where our primary focus is on. Our timeline for it is simple. First, complete the construction by the end of this year. Second, ramp up its production during 2022. Third, attain peak production from uh, during 2023 and 2024. And once Papa Mono is in production, we expect that the project will self-fund our future exploration initiatives. And on the next couple of slides, Joe will highlight this exploration potential. Joe, I'd pass it off to you. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, this is a, a preface to some of my comments on exploration. I'd like to talk a little bit about my background. Um, I've been with with uh, Minera Trace Valleys and with Free Valley Copper now for just over three years. I come from uh, having held positions of senior executive in three meat size companies, Pan American Silver, Silver Standard, and Coor Mining. Over the course of that time, I had the opportunity to probably conduct uh, over 100 due diligence efforts, and every single property I looked at proclaimed to have excellent exploration potential. I'm here to tell you that that isn't the case, but having been with this property for three years, I truly believe that this is a, this is a mine, this is a property with very strong exploration potential. You'll see on this slide, uh, just to confuse you a little bit, uh, we, we made the, the barren rock green on this one, but the center of the property, the dark color, is the um, volcanic rocks that can be a host to mineralization. And you see in very small in the center there, the area where we plan to do our initial exploration, which is less than 5% of our total land holding. Um, and this is the area that Valley that focused their exploration on previously. Uh, over the property, there are numerous outcrops, uh, numerous areas where small artisanal miners have mined. And certainly those will play a role in guiding our initial exploration. Uh, next, please. Uh, Michael, are you advanced? There we go, thank you. Um, we did perform some uh, geophysical surveys on the property, uh, different types. Uh, and this one is showing a, a magnetic survey done over the area of our, where we plan to do our initial exploration. Uh, as you can see, we, it gives us a, quite a head start on our work because there's a very significant signature, geophysical signature, in and around our two operating mines, the Papamono and the Don Gabriel deposits. What that says is these other significant anomalies that we see on the geophysical survey 
will be high priority targets for us uh, combined with outcrops and small mining locations and other uh, geophysical and satellite that we've done. This, uh, this area around the existing mines, as Michael mentioned, the five satellite deposits around Papamono and the significant um, deposit below the Don Gabriel mine will be areas we'll be looking at initially. Next, please. In a little bit more detail on the coming slide here, you'll see uh, more specifically where we, where we plan to do some of our initial work. Uh, in this zone between the Don Gabriel and the Papamono mine, there's a large fault system and uh, you see there's been a, a small amount of drilling done uh, previously, but certainly in the areas that we show highlighted in these rectangles are, are areas where there are magnetic highs and where there are limited drilling and where we plan to start looking intensively. Next, please. The Don Gabriel mine uh, has a deposit below it we call Don Gabriel Vetas, which is Spanish for veins. It's actually a system of veins and mantos down below the existing operating mine that has very limited drilling on it, but the intercepts that we have found uh, have some extremely high grade, one, some being over 2% copper. Uh, this is high on our list of priorities for this initial exploration campaign. Uh, I would say the, you know, we have still not uh, got any bounds on the size and significance that this deposit could hold. Um, and I'm anxious to see what our results will be. Next, please. So here's another look at our at our land holding. Um, we were using a, a combination of methods to look up into the medium and long term on our exploration plan. Our geologists have already started uh, identifying some anomalies uh, reaching out. In, in addition to the main north-south mineralizing system, there are some perpendicular other veins and other structures that we feel like will carry mineralization well out into our property. There are also outcrops and small mines scattered all across our property. And uh, this, is, this is an area, um, you know, we're, we have to be a little bit disciplined in the early stages of our, of our program. We think we have some very high value, high potential targets to start on in the early days, but certainly, um, Nothing is going to be overlooked. And just to let everyone know, our, our exploration program officially started this week. We have our senior exploration geologist on site now, and we're starting some of the early uh, physical preparation for getting this drilling underway. Next, please. Just a couple of quick words about our environmental, social, and governance. Uh, we're a we're we're a good neighbor, a good citizen here. We have to recognize that we have limited resources compared to some of our, our big neighbors, but we do some creative things. One of which is we, we uh, promote a small minor program in which the people from the same community that are our neighbors operate small copper mines, many of which are on our property and actually sell us the ore. Uh, again, uh, 80% of our suppliers are local businesses in the area of Salamanca where our, our mine is located. And a, a wonderful uh, advantage that we have in this area is that most of our miners and our workers can go home at night because we are less than half an hour drive from a reasonable sized city. And we don't have to have a, a large camp like many other competing mines have. Uh, we have all of the, the standard policies and code of ethics and others that we adhere to. And uh, we, we uh, feel like for our, for our size, we're, we're not only uh, doing well, but I think we're a bit more creative than, than some other mines in the area. 
So with that comment, I will pass the presentation back over to Michael. Thank you. Great, Joe. Uh, thanks very much. I'm just going to add one small fact uh, example there uh, to the uh, social side of what we do here at uh, Three Valley Copper and specifically down at site. We initiated a COVID vaccination, vaccination program at site and to date, 75% of our 600 plus workforce are fully vaccinated and 82% have received their first dose. This compares to the Chilean country average of approximately 50% that have been fully vaccinated. vaccinated. So just another uh, little tidbit on how we're engaging the community uh, uh, on, uh, with our work, workers at, uh, at the mine site. Um, but thanks again, Joe. As you read through this last slide, I, I ask you to reflect on what really makes us different when looking at other pure play copper companies in the junior space. Um, you've heard me speak uh, voluminously about uh, various things, but you've also heard Joe talk about the exploration potential. So we, we are in the first innings of this next copper super cycle that we believe wholeheartedly in. And clearly, many others do too. And, and for all those other companies that also believe this, they are in the midst of prospecting in years and possibly even a decade away from first production. We are ready today, and you now know why. Our valet built infrastructure, a $250 million Ferrari that is yet to be taken out of second gear. And, and that is one of our two differentiators and what could be the catalyst to exponential growth. Our second differentiator is our land package. Uh, our land package, it's fully permitted also. Our near-term exploration plans do not require any additional approvals. No additional environmental permits required, no local government sign off, no anything. And as mentioned earlier, our focus is the following. First, we're going to complete the Papamono underground construction by the end of 2021. Second, we're going to ramp up, up its production during 2022. And third, we'll attain peak production from Papamono during 2023 and 2024. And lastly, we will deliver preliminary exploration results in the first half of 2022. And once Papamono is in production, things should only accelerate as the company should be in a position to self-fund its exploration program going forward. The project at today's copper prices has an IRR after tax north of a thousand percent and at a market cap of US 25 million supported by US 250 million dollars of brand used infrastructure, it feels like a really good entry point. At this time, I'm just going to thank you very much for your time and to Adelaide Capital for providing this opportunity. Um, Deb, I think I'm going to send that back over to you now. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Mike. So I do have a couple questions that came in in advance, and I would encourage anyone that's participating to feel free to input some Q&A in the Q&A box. So uh, the first question, oh, sorry, let me just load them up here. My apologies. Um, the first question was around the PFS. Do you have any estimate on when the revised PFS will be made public, or can you explain the dynamics around that? Sure. When we did a financing earlier this year, um, we were relying on our technical report from December 2018. Um, the, the commissions, the Ontario Security Commission and the CSA asked us to uh, amend that report uh, to remove what's called a preliminary economic assessments or a PEA study, which was in Chapter 24. So we've refiled uh, that uh, technical report from December 2018 completely unchanged other than separating the PEA out of that. That was filed in late uh, May of this year. There is no immediate plan to update anything, but uh, it is certainly on our to-do list, especially as, as exploration results come to uh, come to us and come to market over you know, the first half of next year. So I, I would think shortly thereafter, we'll be focusing on updating um, any of our studies at that point. Okay, and uh, can you give us an update on the status of the buyout of the majority, or sorry, minority shareholder? Is the current dispute holding that up? Um, you know, I have to be a little bit cautious on what I say here because there is there is a, a, a litigation going on in the background, and so I, I'll, I'll be a little bit more um, careful on, on how I respond to that because uh, we are precluded because of certain confidentiality uh, parts of the agreement. Um, we have an opportunity to buy out the minority shareholders portion of, in October of this year. And as we've stated publicly, our intention is to do so. 
Um, we don't believe uh, the ongoing litigation is going to affect that, but it is uh, it is likely that they will be commingled somehow. And um, in the coming months, we'll find out more about that. And we will certainly um, share with the public what we can when we know uh, what it is our, our next steps are. Okay. And one other question, and then there's some audience ones as well. Actually, let's leave that one. Let's talk about uh, what's going on in Chile. Um, how will you potentially be impacted by the new taxes being imposed by Chile? Maybe you can give us a little bit of an update on what's going on there. Yeah, no, absolutely. There's, it's hit the, the media um, a lot. I mean, the proposed royalty um, structure that is in front of the Senate right now. So it's gone through various levels of government sitting at the Senate for approval. Probably in the next couple of months, it's gonna be dealt with or heard. Uh, it's likely to go through some sort of iterative process uh, at least that's our belief and how we've been counseled is that the way it is written right now is unlikely to be um, approved. And, and to put context around that, if it does get approved in the way that it's, it's proposed, it would be the effect of doubling the income tax rate in Chile. Um, but this is a top line revenue uh, royalty. Uh, the current royalty regime in Chile is actually based like a tax. Uh, you get the benefit of deducting expenses before you have a royalty to pay. But this one goes right to the top line of revenue. And at today's copper prices, if I recall, I'll be off by a few percentage points, but the royalty would be over 35% of revenue. If you take copper and if you have the the belief that copper is going to go higher for longer and let's use a, a higher number of seven or seven dollars and fifty cents copper price per pound that royalty then moves to 50 percent of revenue so it is an astronomically rich rich tax that will decimate the country both economically and socially if it passes the way it is that, that's our true belief what's very interesting for us though is that under this regime uh, if you maintain production at less than 12,000 tons of cathode annually, and now note that our, our capacity is 18 and a half thousand tons. And if this proposal does go through, this very rich proposal does go through without any amendments, the, we have much more in the way of operational flexibility than the big miners do just because of our fixed, our fixed cost uh, infrastructure. At 18 and a half thousand tons, if we scale that back and maintain it at 12,000 tons a year, we will upwards make between 30 and 50 percent more, we'll create more cash flow than if we were to take production to 18 and a half thousand tons. So we do have that flexibility to provide some nifty workarounds uh, to the existing proposal. What's also notable in this is that the, even the current royalty regime provides for the first 12,000 tons uh, to be exempt from any royalty. So we don't have any royalty on the business right now. So in summary, I do expect that this royalty tax that has been proposed and is sitting at the Senate level is going to be diluted. Uh, I think it would be detrimental for the country. And I think it's more targeted at the large miners that are, uh, you know, that don't have the financial, uh, sorry, don't have the operational flexibility that we have. Um, they just can't scale back like we could and still make uh, a really good cash flow. Okay, thanks for clarifying that. Um, so, what is your budget? Your budget for exploration in twenty twenty one? We have. Um, we've set aside a, a, a couple million dollars uh, over the course of 2021 and into 2022. So I, I, I can't say it specifically for 2021. We haven't put a, a peg on it at December. So as Joe mentioned, we're just starting now. It's going to take some time to, uh, to get the boots on the ground and the drill spinning. But uh, this is going to continue well into 2022. And over that period of time, we have earmarked approximately $2 million. Okay, and when do you expect to raise more equity before becoming self-funded? And if so, how much capital would 
be needed approximately? You know, that's a, a constant conversation we, we're having internally. Um, this is, we're in an environment that is very competitive in Chile. And as a small miner, we're a small to medium sized mining operation. We see that and in, in, it impacts us more often uh, than I think any of us expected. So we're looking, we, we'd rather not uh, raise capital, but I, I can't say that's not a possibility in the future. Uh, we're assessing how the impacts and the local uh, competitive impacts are assessing us. And if we do have to raise capital, we'll, we'll do it very carefully uh, and look for other opportunities to sustain the business. But we do know that the, the priority for us to, is to get Papamono built because that is the catalyst and that is what is going to turn the cash flowing uh, business into what we expect it to be. And it's paramount that we get this done. Okay, and when do you think both Don Gabriel and Peppa Mono are fully up and running? How should one think about total annual copper production for both sites and how long? And then there's a second part, which are what are expected on sustaining costs per pound? And what is your free cash flow potential with copper at $4 a pound based on fully ramped up production? Well, that's a lot to digest in one. Joe, I'm going to ask you to participate with this in this. You can start with the first, and I'll 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 repeat the second when you're ready. Okay. Okay, I'll pick up the first. Can you go back to the first one, Deb? Yeah, no worries. Um, Yeah, of course. So it's just after. Our Don Gabriel and Papo Mona mines are both operating right now. The Don Gabriel is a much more significant production. Uh, We're producing about eighty thousand tons a month of ore from Don Gabriel now. Uh, the area we're mining will wind up in April of next year, at which time we'll idle Don Gabriel for a couple of years while we start focusing on the Papamona production. Papamona will begin production uh, close to the end of this year. We'll ramp up during 2022. These block caving mines take a while to get up and running at full capacity. And then it will have a, a, a cycle of about two and a half years where it's at full production, which is about 90,000 tons a month and higher grade. It has an average grade between 1.2 and 1.5% copper. As it starts tapering off, we'll bring Don Gabriel back into production. And uh, hopefully in the background, as we're as we're uh, operating both of these mines, we are going to have some exploration successes in, in infill and expanding of some of these other satellite deposits and possibly seeing some of these coming in to supplement our production. So that's what I would say. Okay, Did great. we miss anything in there, Deb? Um, all in sustaining cash costs. Yeah, I can I can point to the technical report up there at least for the all in sustaining costs. It was it was south of two dollars. I, I I don't have the number uh, in the palm of my hand, but it was somewhere between a buck eighty and, and two dollars. Now the only caution I put on that is is exactly what's happening in the market today, which is when the technical report was done on 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 costs a couple of years ago. It was a different environment than what we're seeing in Chile today. So I, I do expect cost pressures to uh, to rise and, and show themselves over the coming years, if, uh, especially if we continue in north of $4.50 copper price. So uh, I would caution on, on you know, banking that number, that number of $1.80 to $2. But, uh, and, and we'll be looking to firm that up as, as we start moving through into, into production with Papamola. Okay, great. Thanks, Mike. Um, in, I think the cash cost that was quoted was the operating cash cost, at least in the present presentation of $1.66. And I do have a question, a follow-up question around that. So that does that $1.66 per pound operating cash cost estimate include the interest payments on TBC's $70 million debt? No, it's exclusive of that, yeah. Okay. And then... Um, can you please clarify how 40% of your production is being sold in an off-take to Anglo-American at 289? 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, the asset was restructured last year. Um, as part of the restructuring, one of the ways that we were looking to put a, a floor on our cash flows was to um, enter into a fixed price component of our, of our offtake. And, you know, hindsight's always 2020, so it's a painful conversation now. What we're, what we're looking at is when we did this back in the middle of 2020, copper was trading in around 270, 280 in that, in that range. And we were able to lock in a price and again, to set a floor for our cash flows of $2.89 uh, for 24 months. That was based on a fixed number of tons that we expected to produce uh, and so a schedule, a schedule was uh, determined back in July of 2020 uh, for the next 24 months ending in July 2022 as to what our production was. And we took 40% of that. And that's what uh, has been, is being sold at uh, to Anglo-American. Now, this is not a, a great situation to be on when copper is running between 420 and 450 or, or higher per pound. So um, we're leaving some cash on the table right now. Uh, where it is a pain point is when our production is low the way it is right now. It's it's more um, it's more evident than it would be if we were at full production and that same fixed tonnage, which would be lower than forty percent at the time, um, would be in place. So we are in conversations with Anglo American to look for options on how we can um, take advantage of the copper price today to increase our cash flows. So that is, that's the mechanic. It does expire in July, 2022. Um, in today's copper price environment, we're not happy with it, but at the time during the restructuring, it was a logical move to put a, a floor on our, on our cash flows and protect it from any downside risk. Makes sense. Um, and then I know you touched on cash flows. Do you have a specific timeline to be positive or cash flow positive rather? And, and what would that be? Our initial thoughts is it's going to happen uh, during the back half of next year. 2023 is absolutely for sure for a full calendar year, but we expect cash flows to turn positive, uh, you know, the back half of next year. Uh, where that could change is just based on the preceding uh, response I gave under the offtake, which is if there's uh, if there's a solution between now and then, we could see that change a, a little bit. Um, I guess I, I don't see any other questions. So before we end the session, I mean, this is a great slide to show what you've achieved in the last little while and sort of where the company's positioned. Can you maybe give us some catalysts to watch for over the coming months and years? Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's going to be a little bit repetitive of what Joe and I said earlier. Um, the, the two catalysts really link to our, our the two jewels, that, uh, two jewels that we refer to. Um, it's really going to be the execution of the underground mine and the completion of that by the end of this year. Uh, lots of things. There's a lot of time between now and then. So we're still hopeful and, and on track to do that. Um, so we'll keep that update coming. Um, things are very, uh, very fluid in, in Chile. Uh, as an example, Chile is still under its strictest lockdown since April uh, during during this uh, pandemic. Um, so they've, uh, you know, April, May, and June have been complete lockdown. People not allowed in the country, for example, um, and, unless with special permits. And Joe is there right now, and he's able to get a special permit to get in. So that that's good for us. Um, so it's it's the execution on the underground that thereafter will be the production. Can we can we get the ore out of Papamono under the timelines that we um, we presented here today? And the second would be uh, the second um, catalyst here is you know what are we going to find in our our preliminary uh, drill program uh, in this exploration efforts? Uh, again, we're we're very bullish on the property. We truly believe we have an excellent leader that is overseeing this uh, in John Mortimer. And uh, I think he's equally as excited as we are. He knows the property uh, and he knows the property from a prior life. So that is helpful for us uh, in, in a way that I won't get into, but it's, it is something that, so we're, we're glad for him to be on board. And so between the execution on Papamono and the execution on bringing some 
drill results to market to show the potential or at least the the the, the top of the mountain potential um you know those are the catalysts for this company Great. Well, thank you for that. I don't see any other questions. So I think that's a, a good spot to leave it. Is there anything that you wanted to talk about that we've missed today? No, I just uh, just want to extend my thank you to the group that uh, dialed in here this morning and uh, has hung around for almost an hour. So thank you again, everybody. Look forward thanks. to uh, doing this again soon. Yeah, thanks for walking us through the story. I think it's a really interesting opportunity. I like that there's existing production and a lot of exploration upside around it. Kind of reminds me of, we did some work with um, Northern Vertex last summer and they had a small producing mine with exploration assets around and they've had phenomenal results throughout the fall and now they've merged with Eclipse. So I, I, I like this story, I think it's, uh, it's interesting. So thanks for presenting it. And uh, thank you everyone for participating. If you have any follow-up questions, feel free to reach out and I'll get those answered for you and have a great day.